नमस्कार एंड वेरी वॉम वेलकम यू वॉचिंग वेंटेज आम आकांक्षा स्वरूप The Arctic is the next battleground for superpowers, rivals like the United States and Russia, and military alliances like the NATO. They're doing drills in the region, but why are leading nations racing to prepare for a conflict in the region? We'll get you the answers tonight. Also, a report by Washington Post is testing the unity of the West for Ukraine. It reveals the United States knew about the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines three months in advance. The role of Zelensky and his top military leadership is also under the lens. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Saudi Arabia. America's influence in the region is under threat. The visit is an attempt to undo some of the damage. Also, we'll tell you why Australia is doing away with the bank checks. You're watching Vantage. I'm Akanksha Swaroop, filling in for Palki Sharma. First, the headlines. China's trade with Russia in May soars to the highest level since the start of the Ukraine war. Trade between the two countries last month was worth over $20 billion. It comes as Beijing steps up support for its sanctions hit ally. China is Russia's largest trading partner. NATO to begin its largest ever Air Force deployment exercise in Europe next week. The 10-day exercise will include over 200 military aircraft from 25 NATO and partner countries. U.S. says while the exercise is defensive in nature, it is intended to send a message to Russia. Israel slums U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris. Harris had hinted that the Netanyahu government's legal reforms could curb the judiciary's independence. Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Cohen hits back and Biden's deputy says she's ignorant of their reform plans. Air India sends relief jet to rescue passengers stranded in Russia. Tuesday's New Delhi to San Francisco flight was diverted to Russia's far east after the plane developed engine trouble. There were over 200 passengers and 16 crew on board the US-bound flight. And England mulls expanding access to weight loss drugs. Doctors could soon be allowed to prescribe obese people with weight loss drugs under a pilot scheme. A 2019 survey said there were over 12 million adults living with obesity in England, accounting for 28% of the population. When we talk about the Arctic, what comes to your mind? The icy waters, snow-capped mountains, and a region covered in a blanket of ice. That's the mental image most of us have. But all this is set to change. The Arctic could lose all its ice. It is melting fast, and it is too late to reverse this. Leading scientists believe the Arctic will be ice-free in the summers come 2030. This is what a new study has warned. Perhaps the world's leading militaries saw this coming. Already, they are preparing for this scenario. Rivals like the United States and Russia and military alliances like the NATO, they are doing drills in the region. They're gearing up to fight. So very soon, these picturesque views could be replaced with images of military bases and troops training to hold their ground. The Arctic is the next superpower battleground. But why are leading nations racing to prepare for a conflict in the region? Tonight, we'll get you the answers. We begin with the science. Like I said, a new study has been published. It projects the Arctic will be ice-free during the summer. This wasn't an unlikely scenario. Experts have predicted an ice-free Arctic before. Earlier, they said it could happen by 2050. But right now, the ice is melting fast. Experts fear the Arctic will have ice-free summers as soon as the 2030s. That's two decades earlier. It is difficult to pinpoint the exact date. But there are no doubts over the fate of the Arctic. It will lose its ice for many. This is a scary scenario. But some leading world powers sense an opportunity here. They want a piece of this region. Already this year, we have witnessed several drills. 
In April, Russia conducted military drills in the Arctic Sea. These were large-scale drills. 1,800 soldiers, 15 ships and 40 aircraft were involved. These drills were aimed at this area, the Northeast Passage. This is a sea lane. It runs along Russia's northern coastline, from the Atlantic to Pacific Oceans. The ice there is melting. So this passage has become more accessible. For Russia, this could be a new trade route. It will cut travel time significantly. That's one of the reasons why Russia is warming up to the Arctic. But there are other contenders in the mix. Let's look at the map again. This is the Arctic region. Multiple countries surround the ocean. Russia, Canada, the United States, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Sweden, even Iceland. Each of them have their own interests to protect. The melting ice has kicked off a race between Arctic nations. They are rushing their resources there, asserting claims and doubling down on security. All in the attempt to project power and influence. Take the United States, for instance. It has a training center in the Arctic, the Northern Warfare Training Center. It is in Black Rapids, Alaska. That's near the Southern Arctic Circle. American troops now regularly train there. NATO is conducting drills too. Last month, they conducted drills in Finland. Finland is the newest member of NATO. Thousands of troops participated in these drills. What was the purpose? Well, to enhance interoperability. U.S. Army is here training to, uh, w with our newest uh, NATO ally uh, to build that capability to help defend Finland if, if, if anything happens. That's our commitment to them. They're talking about the possibility of a conflict with Russia. If Finland is attacked, the entire NATO will rush to help. For all you know, the Arctic should witness such a conflict. The quicker the ice melts, the greater will be the chances of a conflict. Look at this map now. There are multiple military installations in the region now. They're keeping a close eye on the Arctic because the stakes are high beyond security considerations. The Arctic is rich in natural resources. It holds 13% of the world's undiscovered oil and 30% of untapped natural gas. There are rare earth elements too. They could be valued at $1 trillion. And all these resources are up for grabs. The only question is, who controls the Arctic? There are no clear answers because there are no clear borders. Key stakeholders have overlapping claims in the region. They didn't care much about the Arctic. After all, this region was just ice before. But as the Arctic begins to lose its innocence, expect this battle for territory to intensify. It's been more than 450 days since Russia invaded Ukraine. We've already seen many battles, a number of offensives and counter-offensives. But one episode continues to capture public imagination, the Nord Stream sabotage. Last September, two gas pipelines were hit by clandestine bombings, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Both of them carry gas from Russia to Germany. But who launched the attack? That depends on who you ask. The Russians blame US and allies. Ukraine says it doesn't know. And some European countries blame Russia. But now, the plot has gotten thicker. The Washington Post has released a bombshell report. What does it say? Three major things. Number one, the CIA knew that Ukraine was planning such an attack on Nord Stream. They got the tip off in June. So around three months before the sabotage, a European intelligence agency got this report. It was then relayed to the US and Germany. Number two, the plan was to use a small team of divers. They would report directly to Ukraine's commander-in-chief. And number three, President Zelensky was not in the loop. This was done by design. Ukraine wanted Zelensky to have plausible deniability. Like you see in movies, he didn't know about it, so he wasn't responsible. Now, this report is based on leaked secret documents. They were published by a US soldier on the Discord platform. The claim that stands out is this. Washington knew Ukraine had plans to strike Nord Stream. They knew by June 2022. And three months later, the attack actually happens. 
Was that a coincidence? Well, there is no such thing in war. The idea that Ukraine plotted the attack is not new. Take a look at this New York Times report. U.S. officials blamed pro-Ukrainian groups for the sabotage. What they lacked was evidence, maybe a smoking gun. Could this leaked intelligence report be that evidence? It's certainly possible. But beyond fixing blame, this report could alter the balance of the war. You see, Western aid to Ukraine comes with a condition that Kiev will only defend, not attack. That Ukraine will fight within its territory. But Nord Stream doesn't fit that condition. It is located hundreds of kilometers away in the Baltic Sea. Its military value is nil. But politically, it's a big risk. If Ukraine is implicated, Western powers may have to rethink their support. So far, there is no indication of that, but European countries have not concluded their probe. If Ukraine is directly named, it could be in trouble. Just put yourself in Europe's shoes. How would you feel if your ally blew up your biggest pipeline? And worse, lied about it. That's one part of the problem. The second is the style of attack. Ukraine seems to be relying on shadow warfare. We have seen sabotage incidents across Russia. We have seen drones over Moscow. We have also seen pro-Ukraine militia storming Russian towns. On paper, Ukraine has nothing to do with it. But let's be real. US officials believe this is Ukraine's new strategy, to use covert tactics, and it has two advantages. One, it helps to build pressure on Russia, and two, Zelensky is insulated from it. All decisions are purposely hidden from the president, which means he is not lying when he denies it. Now, we are in no place to judge any of these tactics. Russia has killed hundreds of innocent Ukrainians. It has launched an unprovoked war. So Ukraine is free to use any strategy they see fit. But the downside is this. The Americans are still uncomfortable about taking the fight to Russia. Hence their initial hesitation about fighter jets or long-range missiles. How will they react to such Ukrainian strategies? Ultimately, that's what matters. Ukraine isn't the only problem. America has to worry about China too. When Biden took over the White House, he pledged to manage America's differences with China. But this approach has proved to be challenging. Tensions have escalated in recent years, dangerous military encounters have increased, and communication channels have remained frozen. Until now, US and China now want to talk. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is all set to visit China this month. It is an attempt to stabilize the relationship. But before Blinken sits down to talk, the U.S. and its allies are facing fresh provocations from the PLA. Our next report brings you the details. A close call in the South China Sea. and a near miss in the Taiwan Strait. Tensions between the U.S. and China are at an all-time high, and these close encounters are only raising the stakes. Today, there was yet another provocation from the PLA. This time, the target was South Korea. Chinese and Russian aircraft made aggressive moves. They entered South Korea's Air Defense Identification Zone, or ADIZ. This is like a border in the skies. When you enter this area, you need to identify yourself. Otherwise, any plane can be considered as hostile. But Chinese and Russian jets went in unannounced. Beijing said they were on a joint patrol. But for Seoul, the move was a provocation. In response, they scrambled their own jets. Diplomatic protest followed. The South Koreans say such flights can cause tensions in the region. They are not the only ones who are complaining. Earlier this week, Japan was targeted too. Russian and Chinese bomber planes showed up in the Sea of Japan. These planes flew together till the East China Sea, where two more Chinese fighter jets joined the formation. Just like its neighbor, Japan too scrambled its jets in response. Why are the hostilities rising? The actions of China and Russia coincide with military exercises in the region. 
The U.S. and its allies have been doing drills in the Indo-Pacific. Countries like South Korea, Japan and the Philippines have participated with large contingents. That's not all. The U.S. has stepped up its deployments in the region too. The expanded presence is supposed to be a deterrence. Instead, they're leading to more close calls. Recently, the U.S. Defense Secretary admitted these encounters could lead to dangerous outcomes. Provocative intercepts of our, our aircraft and, and also our allies' aircraft, uh, that's very concerning, and we would hope that uh, they would alter their, their, uh, their actions. Uh, but since they haven't yet, I'm concerned about, uh, at some point, uh, having an incident that could very, very quickly spiral out of control. Washington has been seeking a dialogue with Beijing. For weeks, China was reluctant, but recently it had a change of heart. There has been a flurry of high-level contacts. First, CIA Director Bill Burns visited Beijing. A secret visit happened in May at China's invitation. Then, the U.S. National Security Advisor met with Wang Yi. China's top foreign policy official. They met in Vienna for two days. Then this week, there was another meeting. Two senior American officials met with their counterparts in Beijing. The talks seemed to have paved the way for another high-level meeting. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will now visit China. But ahead of Blinken's arrival... The truth is that the U.S. warships and jets traveled all the way to China's doorstep to provoke, insisting on conducting close-in reconnaissance near the airspace and territorial waters of China and flexing their military muscles. This is not safeguarding freedom of navigation, but promoting navigation hegemony. It is a blatant military provocation, which is the root cause of maritime and air security risks. And that's the major flashpoint, the growing military developments and the lack of communication channels between the two armed forces. The military-level dialogue is yet to be revived. And without that, the risk of a dangerous escalation will continue to remain high. Speaking of the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, he's in Saudi Arabia on a three-day visit one that promises to be a challenge for him. On Tuesday, Blinken met Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The talks covered a range of issues like security, economy, terrorism and the war in Yemen. But one line from the US statement stands out. Let me read that out. The secretary also emphasized that our bilateral relationship is strengthened by progress on human rights. That's important to note. Joe Biden campaigned by promising a tough line on Riyadh. He vowed to make Saudi Arabia a pariah state. But three years later, he's backtracking. There are three reasons why. One, he needs Saudi support to control oil prices. This weekend, the kingdom slashed supply by one million barrels. It's not good news for American inflation. Two, he needs to contain Chinese influence. Saudi Arabia has been cozying up to China. They even let Beijing broker a normalization deal with Iran. So what does Biden do? He tries to mend fences with Riyadh. And number three, he needs Saudi Arabia to recognize Israel. Symbolically, it would mean a coup for Biden. But politically too, it's important. An axis between Israel and Arab states will be a bulwark against Iran. It would extend American influence. The only question is, will MBS play along? The truth is, he's spoiled for choice. He's got China in his corner. He's got Russia working with him in OPEC Plus. And now the US is courting him. So what does he do? Right now, it looks like he's not picking any side. Just think back to the last century. West Asia was a pawn in great power rivalries. And what did they get in return? War and instability. So now there seems to be a realization, an understanding that regional issues must be solved regionally. There's no point betting on big powers. Look at all the recent events. Iran has reopened its embassy in Saudi Arabia. It was closed seven years ago in 2016. Since then, Riyadh and Tehran were locked in a cold war. They backed opposing sides in the conflict between Yemen and Syria. But now they're mending fences. The foreign ministers met in Cape Town last Friday. Iran said good progress was made in bilateral ties. Another development was reported on Saturday. 
Iran announced the creation of a new naval alliance. Guess who's on board? Saudi Arabia and the UAE. It would have been unthinkable a few years ago. The alliance also includes Bahrain, Qatar, Iraq, Pakistan and India. We don't know what shape it will take, but Iran says the objective is regional security. The timing of this decision is important. Just days ago, the UAE walked out of a US-led maritime coalition. So the message is loud and clear. America's space and authority in West Asia is shrinking. What does that mean for the region? Also for stakeholders like India? Well, shrinking doesn't mean disappearing. The US is still the chief weapons supplier in the region. That won't be changing overnight. So the talk of West Asia picking China over the US is premature. But there's a more realistic assessment, a multipolar West Asia. That should be India's goal as well. If West Asia becomes beholden to China, it's not good news. Much of India's energy comes from there. Plus, there is a sizable Indian population living in the Gulf. So more engagement is key, whether bilaterally or through groups like the I2U2. As for Antony Blinken, he's got his work cut out. The US has very little leverage over MBS. Weapons is the only carrot Biden can dangle. But Democrats back home won't be happy. Staying with West Asia, let's look at something else making news in Iran. Tehran says it has developed a hypersonic missile. The missile named Fatah was unveiled yesterday. The unveiling ceremony was attended by Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi. Also present were senior commanders of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard. Why the grand event? Because a hypersonic missile marks a new milestone in Iran's missile program. A missile is considered hypersonic when it can travel at least five times the speed of sound. That makes it a problem for most missile defense systems. The new Fatah missile can allegedly travel at 15 times the speed of sound. If it isn't an exaggeration, that would be quite a feat. Iran says the Fatah hypersonic missile is a crucial deterrent. Here's our report. Iran, the Shiite hegemon in West Asia, Saudi Arabia's rival for dominance, Israel's existential threat, and America's perpetual headache in what it calls the Middle East. Tehran has caused a stir yet again. It has unveiled a powerful new weapon. This is the Fatah hypersonic missile. It was introduced with great fanfare on Tuesday. Top Iranian officials were invited to the show, from President Ibrahim Raisi to the commanders of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. And the center stage was reserved for the Iranian military's latest toy, the Fatah hypersonic missile. Iran says it's a game changer. We are able to precisely hit any target within the range of 1400 kilometers. And there exists no system that can rival or counter this missile. That is General Amir Ali Hajizadeh the commander of the Revolutionary Guard Aerospace Division. His department developed the Fatah missile. He says it can reach speeds between 13 to 15 times the speed of sound. That's Mark 13 to Mark 15 in technical terms. It's quite an achievement. To qualify as hypersonic, a missile just needs to be five times faster than the speed of sound or Mark 5. The Fatah can supposedly reach three times that speed. Impressive, if true. Then there's General Hajizadeh's other boast. He says there exists no system that can rival or counter the Fatah missile. Was that just grandstanding? Two missile defense systems in West Asia may have been on the general's mind when he made this claim. The US Patriot system and Israel's Iron Dome. Both are famously effective. Both are used by Iran's rivals. Now Iran says nothing can counter its attacks. So is Tehran trying to drum up tensions to provoke a new conflict? Well, Iran says this will boost its deterrence power and help maintain peace. Today we feel that the deterrent power has been formed. This power is an anchor of lasting security and peace for the regional countries. Deterrence isn't a new concept, of course. Everyone relies on it. The concept is simple. 
make the enemy think it isn't worth attacking you due to the potential casualties. All countries, especially the nuclear-armed ones, employ this thinking. But while the new missile may dissuade a military attack, Iran's enemies have already responded with hostile moves of a different kind more sanctions. As soon as Iran went public with the Fatah missile yesterday, the U.S. went to work. Yesterday itself, Washington imposed over a dozen new sanctions. They targeted people and entities in Iran, China and Hong Kong. Why China and Hong Kong? The U.S. believes that firms in China and Hong Kong are helping Iran's military ambitions. One of the people sanctioned is Iran's defense attaché in Beijing, Davud Damkhani. The U.S. says he helped procure parts and technology for key actors in Iran's ballistic missile development. And it doesn't seem far-fetched. China has been developing hypersonic missiles for a while now. Beijing's hypersonic program is ahead of Washington's. It's very possible that it helped out a fellow U.S. rival. Now, the question is, what next? Will this new Iranian weapon spur the U.S. into ramping up its own hypersonic program? Will Israel enter the hypersonic arms race? What about Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states? The only thing that's certain is that tensions in West Asia aren't dying down any time soon. Let's talk about Memphis. This is a city in the U.S. And these days, one of its busiest places is not a cafe or a monument. It is an impound lot where tow truck drivers wait for hours on end as they make one drop off after another. And victims too have to wait, but for days or even weeks to get their stolen cars back. In this impound lot, thousands of cars have been squeezed in a tight space and most of them are stolen. All thanks to the grand auto theft. No, not the video game, a real life auto theft which ironically has been inspired by something virtual. TikTok videos. Yes, TikTok, the social media app, has given birth to an explosion of auto thefts. And they're taking over US cities like New York, Baltimore, Cleveland, Milwaukee, San Diego, and Seattle. And the target of these thefts are mainly two manufacturers, two South Korean automakers who have proven to be especially vulnerable to this theft. And I'm talking about Kia and Hyundai. Let's look at some numbers. About 11,000 cars were stolen in Memphis last year. That's twice as many as in 2021. And roughly a third of them were late model Kias and Hyundais. New York reported 977 thefts in the first four months this year. That's up from 148 in the same period in 2022. And the number of stolen Hyundais and Kias have doubled since last year. Hyundai and Kia thefts increased by 767% in Chicago last year and 61% of vehicles stolen in St. Louis in the last year are Kias and Hyundais. You got the drift and so do these cities. So now they have sued these two car makers. They've had enough and they're taking the car makers to court over negligence and selling vehicles that are too easy to steal. These cities have faulted the automaker's failure. What are we talking about? Between 2011 and 2022, Kia and Hyundai have promised to do something they did not. They were supposed to install anti-theft devices called immobilizers in their cars. As many as 8.3 million US vehicles need these immobilizers. But they weren't updated. And the result? Auto theft within seconds. Crime sprees, public harm, even reckless driving. People don't need any sophisticated tech to steal cars. All that's required is a TikTok app and a quick search on how to steal a car. In a matter of seconds, tens of thousands of videos line up. They even have their own hashtag and they provide tips on vehicle theft. They tell you it doesn't take much. All you need is a screwdriver, a USB cord and a hot wiring know-how. Simple, right? Apparently so, and let me be clear, in no way am I encouraging you to steal a car or sharing hot tips with you. I'm telling you just what the world has come to and how appalling this is. Because do you know who these videos target? Who end up as culprits of auto theft? Teenagers or young adults? Taking the example of Memphis again, more than half of the 175 people arrested this year 
were teenagers. And this is just one example of many. But why are teens stealing these cars? Experts say mainly for kicks and viral views, but also for other crimes like robberies and car crashes. So the damage is not just cars. Several teens have died or been seriously hurt because of this, let alone the harm this brings to the victims, yet brimming with auto theft knowledge, coupled with newfound TikTok-inspired confidence, these teens are going after Kia and Hyundai cars, which have become quite the sweet spot due to their failures, but also because of their popularity. The two Korean car brands accounted for about a tenth of US auto sales last year. Except now, they seem to be even more popular for wrong reasons. And now they are clearly under fire. But this isn't new. Last month, the automakers reached a $200 million settlement in a consumer class action. That covered about 9 million vehicle owners in the US. But even so, the biggest battle these car makers face is not against these lawsuits, but a simple TikTok trend that has gone viral and found a fan in the teenage American spirit. And now it is ripping them off one viral video at a time. The question is, when will this real life game of Grand Theft Auto end? Now let's shift focus to France. The country saw another round of protests yesterday. Protests against President Emmanuel Macron's new pension law. This was the 14th mass protest against the law. It came ahead of a parliamentary debate set to take place tomorrow. Opposition parties are going to try and strike down this pension law. Yesterday's protests were supposed to be a show of strength, but that strength seems to be wavering. The turnout was the lowest since these protests began. This is according to both the protest organizers and government officials. So has Macron finally won? Has the protest movement run out of steam or is something else on the cards? Here's our report. Thousands of people took to the streets of Paris once again. This time too, they were protesting against France's new pension law. Like in previous protests, things were set on fire. Clashes took place with the French police while police resorted to tear gas to disperse the protesters. Some remain defiant. We must not give up. We must demonstrate because if we give up, at the moment the government does everything and anything. They're going to pass laws and then they'll say, yes, there's nothing more to be done. Yes, they've already voted. What's to be done? And like that, we're going to let things slide. No, we have a right. We have to demonstrate, we always have to demand. You have to see things through to the end. President Emmanuel Macron has raised the French retirement age from 62 to 64 years. He said it was necessary that the French Treasury could not support the growing pension costs. But the people weren't on board. Because of his new law, Macron has been under pressure for months. People have accused him of ramming the law through without following due process, which is true. He used an emergency measure to pass the law when he saw Parliament would not agree. This was in April. The autocratic move had enraged the French public. The reform has passed, but it still hasn't been accepted by the people. It never has nor by the parliament. There was a vote aiming to block it, but it didn't succeed. But it's different from a vote to make it pass. The reform passed without our democracy, so it's important to make the government understand that we never wanted this reform, and that it's time that the people speak, because it shows that the government doesn't care more and more about people's will. And so it's important that we take the power back on that level. Over 782,000 people had demonstrated against Macron's diktat on the 1st of May. Those are the government's official figures. Protest organizers had claimed that the real number was three times as much. But yesterday's protests seemed subdued in comparison. The government says only 281,000 people came out to protest. Even the protest organizers say the turnout was low. So, does this mean that the protests are winding down? Well, there are some people who are steadfast. 
I'm here for the 14th time. I've taken days off work. I've lost a lot of money, but I'm here and I'll always be here. Some others blame external factors for the low turnout, like the summer. They say the protests will pick up again once the weather improves. We know very well that they are going to do the same thing to us. It's summer, so there will be far fewer mobilizations. We are getting ready to organize ourselves for the autumn. Some seem more pessimistic, especially about tomorrow's parliamentary motion. The reform has passed, but it still hasn't been accepted by the people. It never has, nor by the parliament. There was a vote aiming to block it, but it didn't succeed. But it's different from a vote to make it pass. The reform passed without our democracy, so it's important to make the government understand that we never wanted this reform, and that it's time that the people speak, because it shows that the government doesn't care more and more about people's will. And so it's important that we take the power back on that level. The opposition has sponsored a motion to cancel the minimum pension age increase. They will try and repeal Macron's pension law. But it's unlikely that they'll succeed. Why? Because of a catch. Lawmakers cannot pass legislation that weighs on public finances without measures to offset those costs. So the repeal attempt might get thrown out. But the motion and the protests on the street will succeed in one thing. Reminding Macron that the road ahead will continue to be rough. It's the biggest headline in global sports, except it's more political than sports. A major golf merger has been announced. Three parties are involved. PGA Tour, which looks after golf in North America. DP Tour, which handles the European leg. And Live Golf, which is a breakaway league funded by Saudi Arabia. It's hard to explain how big this is. So to make it easier, let's understand the basics. PGA Tour was the top dog in golf. They organized most of the big events. They also had contracts with all major golfers. But one important side note, PGA is not a commercial entity. It is a non-profit organization. Last year, a new entity entered this world, Live Golf. It is funded by the PIF or the Public Investment Fund. The PIF is Saudi Arabia's sovereign fund, so deep pockets. In 2022, they offered lucrative contracts to PGA golfers. We're talking millions of dollars. A lot of them left PGA and began playing for Live Golf, like Dustin Johnson, Cameron Smith and Phil Mickelson. But as always, the empire struck back. PGA sued players who violated their contract. Some big names also came out in support. None bigger than these two. Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy. Live Golf offered Tiger Woods $800 million, but he said no. McElroy got a $400 million offer, but he too rejected. There were two main reasons behind their decision. One was the legacy of golf. The Saudi league had new styles of play. It wasn't the true essence of golf. And two, the Saudi stigma. The PIF and Saudi Arabia are one and the same. Not everyone wanted such an association. They refused to be part of the sports washing. But cut to Tuesday, all that went down the drain. Apparently, PGA and Live Golf had been talking for a while. The new plan is to merge and create a new entity. It won't be non-profit. It will be purely commercial. The PIF is also promising to invest billions of dollars into this new entity. I know everyone is calling it a merger. And on paper, it is. But for all practical purposes, this is a hostile takeover. Saudi Arabia will now run golf. It's not a proud moment for PGA chief Jay Monahan. He had promised to fight live golf in 2022. Now, he says, circumstances change. I recognize that people are going to call me a hypocrite. And any time I've said anything, I said it with the information I had at that moment. And I said, I said it based on someone that's trying to compete for the PGA Tour and our players. Um, and so I accept those criticisms. But circumstances do change. And I think that, you know, in looking at the big picture and looking, you know, looking, at, looking at it this way, that's, that's, what, that's what got us to this point. PGA says the merger will end divisions. But the opposite is happening. 
Some golfers have come out in open criticism. A, they were not consulted about the deal. And B, many of them turned down lucrative contracts with Live Golf. They did so to protect PGA, the same PGA which has now betrayed them. So what happens next? All legal cases between PGA and Live Golf will end. Logical, since they have merged. Also, players who joined Live Golf can go back to PGA Tours. So no more Live Golfers and PGA Golfers. Everyone can play everywhere. I know it's a bit technical if you don't follow golf. But like I said, this is also about politics. Saudi Arabia is not a golfing country. It's not like they are emotionally invested in the sport. This is pure sports washing. Saudi Arabia is using its money to take over golf. You may ask, why golf? Because the sport was struggling for relevance. Viewership was down, prize money and advertising was down. So Saudi Arabia's petrodollars were too good to refuse. But don't think it's only golf. Saudi Arabia's PIF has bought 75% stake in four national clubs. They are planning to splurge. Cristiano Ronaldo already plays there. Karim Benzema joined this week. And rumour is Lionel Messi could be next. Saudi Arabia's plan is to use sports to hide the bad stuff. Things like human rights abuses or their treatment of women. Experts call this strategy sports washing. It has led to backlash from rights organizations and activists. Even the golf merger has been criticized. Families of 9-11 victims have slammed the PGA Tour. Remember, the attackers on 9-11 were Saudi citizens. But none of it seems to matter. Not the rebellion by players, not the criticism by fans, not the backlash from rights organizations. All that matters is the money. I guess PGA chief Jay Monaghan had refused even a meeting with Live Golf. But now he's effectively sold out to Riyadh. Don't ignore this story because it's boring old golf. Because it could be your favourite sport next. When was the last time you used a cheque? It's probably been a while, right? Because using cheque has become a rare occurrence. They are old-fashioned, costly and time-consuming. With banking at our fingertips, who wants to visit an actual bank to deposit a cheque anymore? As ancient and taxing as this sounds, there was a time when cheques were the hot new payment tech. This was in the years after World War II, when newly affluent households across the world adopted cheques. But now, these pieces of paper are a remnant of labour-intensive banking era. Which is why many countries want the check to check out of their banking system. And Australia is one of them. It has signed the check's death warrant and the land down under wants to end its use by 2030. But this is not too surprising. Over the past decade, there has been a 90% decline in the use of checks in Australia, which have become a mere legacy payment in the country. Only a small number of them are being used. The government says 98% of personal checks and 100% of those in commercial settings can be serviced through internet banking. So what's the plan? A winding down process is expected and the government plans to begin it soon. The banking system will now have to reduce its dependence on checks and move on to use other payment methods. They have a deadline for this. They need to transition by 2028. And by 2030, the use of checks will be completely discontinued. The government wants this transition to be gradual and coordinated. Question is, why now? If checks have been on a continuous decline, why is Australia suddenly thinking about them? Because big changes are underway and the country is actively bracing for the digital era. So it is introducing a range of payment reforms and discontinuation of checks is just one of them is setting out a roadmap because it wants to modernize their payment infrastructure. And Australia isn't the only one doing so. Many countries have reduced using cheques. Some have even stopped altogether. In India, the share of cheque payments has been steadily declining. It reduced from 14% in 2010 to 3% now. In the UK, cheques now account for less than 1% of retail bank payments. Germany, Sweden and Norway use almost no written checks. Finland abandoned the personal check in 1993. 
Poland followed suit in 2006. So countries are reducing their dependency on checks. And what is their new financial love affair? Digital payments. More and more countries are transitioning to digital money transfers, depending on contactless, real-time payments. Two-thirds of adults worldwide now make or receive a digital payment, whose share in developing economies grew from 35% in 2014 to 57% in 2021. And this change was further spurred by the pandemic, which increased the use of digital payments, especially in low- and middle-income economies, where over 40% of adults made online payments for the first time since the start of the pandemic. In India, more than 80 million adults made their first digital merchant payment after the start of the pandemic. While in China, over 100 million adults did. So everyone seems to be moving on to greener, faster, more real-time pastures. But let's remember that checks aren't without their advantages. Many corporate bodies still want to use them. They believe the process of clearing checks deters cyber criminals. Many small businesses, too, depend on checks. So do people who aren't adept to online payments. But as useful or emotional as this sounds, the times are changing. More countries are looking to digital payments. And maybe soon, it will be time for checks to check out. And now, it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Norway, Finland and Sweden are holding joint military drills. It is called the Arctic Challenge 23. Personnel from 14 countries and about 150 aircraft are participating. In the United States, two chimneys were downed in Pennsylvania. Their operation was halted in April 2022. And in UK, tiger cubs went swimming for the first time in a London zoo. And finally, what makes June 7th significant? We are taking you back in history. On this day in 1975, the first ever Men's Cricket World Cup began in England. India and England played the first match of the tournament. England won the first match, but West Indies won the first ever World Cup. We leave you with that. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. is the investigation in which if Delhi police will find any you know evidence they will certainly find a charge sheet.
third aspect is the prosecution part which will happen in the fast track court as mandated under our constitution and court will pronounce him guilty or may convict him basis on the trial and the charge sheet file by the delhi police along with evidences see now replying to your question it is good that the belief in central government has been restored by that what happened in supreme court it was central government through solicitor general who submitted that they are willing and ready to do this fir and before supreme honorable supreme court could pass any directions okay. uh, it was already submitted Solicitor General, that on same day both the FIR to be on our stand since the beginning is that anything which has to happen which should happen in a legal framework in a constitutional framework. Okay. Let me ask Monica Mehrotra. The fact that this has been going on for a month and a half, there are two sets of FIRs that have been filed. Uh, the wrestlers have given their statements to the Delhi Police, mm -hmm. and also they've gone and recorded statements from uh, uh, Brijbhush and Sharan and people close to him. Ah. Uh, the police's contention by way of sources is if there was any material uh, that warranted arrest and particularly because one of the accusers happens to be a minor, then he would have been arrested by now. The fact that he's not been arrested is indicative that uh, there isn't material enough uh, to show that uh, Brijbush and Sharan's arrest is warranted. That is what Delhi police sources are claiming. Uh, you think so? Are we all that blind? Let's not get into technicalities, but let me tell you, Zaka, it has been absolutely sinful. It's been sinful and arrogant, or I would say a meek behavior of the tongue-tied sports minister towards the dignity and pride of these wrestlers. I mean, look at the way they've got the laws of this country. If they are saying something, why is the government so deaf? Why didn't they hear them? It took them so long. A, they did the protest earlier on a promise. That okay, things will be sorted out, and we'll look into it. Nothing happened. Mere lip service, and then they resumed their protest for good 35, 40 days, and look how they were treated. They were dragged. They, they were assaulted by the police, uh, police uh, personals. Look at the way the stuff was thrown around. Is this the way you treat the honor and dignity of our country? That's no, but, but ma'am, what the are you what that the what the BJP I, yeah, is saying yeah. again by way of sources is that. You know, if there is material uh, to show, even an iota of material to show that this man, Brijbush and Sharan, uh, did all the things that he is accused of, then arrest would have been automatic because under POXO, uh, you have to get arrested. Welcome, you're watching Breaking on News 18. I'm Akanksha Swaroop. Let's dive into this new segment with some breaking inputs coming in from Manipur. We are now learning that after Home Minister Amit Shah's visit to the state, many were